if you're not, if you're doing it in a well-intended, helpful way, and you can get the consumer to understand that. So if me walking into the store with my device helps me to know that you to know that I'm here, you to know that I was searching something online and direct me to where that is in the store, I actually don't mind. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Robert Schmidt, also known as Mr. IoT, and I am the chief IoT technologist for Deloitte with a deep passion for all things digital. This week on Coffee with Mr. IoT, my guest is Christina Bienek. Uh, she is the consulting leader for retail and consumer products. Welcome on the show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Robert. I am happy, happy to be here. I have to tell you, we've talked about doing this a few weeks, and I, I, I couldn't think of a better week to talk about retail and consumer products than when it's just in the holiday season. Right. I mean, how timely can it be? This is like game time for every client and everyone in our industry. This is uh, the make or break time for many, many retail and consumer products companies. But I mean, in reality, it hasn't, I mean, it's done now, right? I mean, now it's all us just going shopping because all the work for us is kind of over. When is the peak season for you when sort of like everything hits the um, the fan, when, it, when everything goes on? Listen, so we, uh, you're absolutely right. For us in serving our clients, like, their product is bought. I mean, what, what is flowing and coming in, or if they are manufacturing it, they've done that. So those tough decisions of what products and where to get it and what to make and how I'm going to position my brands, my advertising, my marketing, that's all done. Our work in some cases started eight months ago. So some of the things that you needed to have in place from a technology perspective, the analytics and the data and the insights to help make those decisions, depending on the lead time and where you sit in that value chain, so if I'm actually the manufacturer, the CP side, the wholesaler or the retailer, we've been working for months to get to, for some, you know, some of our clients, this is what makes or breaks their year. Um, and probably more when you think about fashion um, and some of the, you know, food and grocery has a little bit more stability, but a lot of product categories, this is it. And it really, you know, it starts that, I would say it starts over that Thanksgiving weekend, but as you probably experienced, we had a lot of retailers that had uh, the holidays up starting in September. So there's been a pull forward of when I begin and look for consumers to start spending with me. When I worked at Activision, we had a thing, you know, my supply chain VP always said, September, October, you cannot implement any systems. <laughs> Don't do anything to the systems in September, October. And then we had this negotiation, is September still okay? And yeah. so forth. Because I mean, you know, the stuff ships out and it's got to be done by then. Yeah. So I, I want to ask you about this season and sort of like, I want to ask from two angles. Um, one, what technology wise has really changed this year? I'm curious, you know, I'm a technologist at heart, even yeah. though I always try to make business or put it to good business use. So what's new this year and what are people seeing out there? But also what else is new? What's different this holiday season than others that uh, you are seeing out there? I'm curious to hear. Yeah, so a, a couple of things and I'll laugh that comment about the holiday freeze. It still happens, even though we're in a much more agile world of how we are implementing or provisioning, whatever we're doing, it should be faster. But we still have a lot of companies that go into that lockdown. Now it's not in September in most places anymore, but you do hit a point in time where it's, we're frozen, we can't be changing anything. We're really just fixing if we have issues. Um, you know, I will tell you this holiday season, we, you know, we do an annual survey of kind of consumer spending and sentiment. One of the big shifts that we've seen and we expected it, and we, we certainly saw it over the beginning of, of Thanksgiving um, from Black Friday through Cyber Monday is just a, a greater propensity to shop online. So less traffic into stores, but you're seeing more once you're in a store, people trying to speed up the convenience factor. How do I have a faster checkout? What are the things that I can do to enable with technology to get someone in to find their product? So you see a lot around like, findability. Is it available in my store? Where do, where can I get it in my store? 
We saw a lot of buy online, pick up in store, return in store. You saw those things last year. Those are table stakes now. So you, you pretty much see that across the board. And now what I would say you saw more investments by retailers is how do I try to start to either personalize the offer to get more specific in what I'm doing and turning on some technology and capabilities anchored in kind of the data and the insights to do it. But you'll, you're seeing across the board this easier, frictionless, you know, Amazon Go has really pushed the envelope um, and challenged. Now, did everybody get there for this holiday? No. But but the Amazon Go store, and really you could say it dated back to kind of the Whole Foods acquisition and this connectivity of Amazon and stores, you're seeing a greater focus on what, what do I need to do to enable the technology to have a better experience in my store that is seamless to what I'm doing with the consumer online. So how do I make, whether it's a mobile checkout, finding my product, the product pages, the information around it, you're seeing some gamification happening of how people are doing research and what's going on there. So it's a host of things combining really that, that holistic experience. So I wouldn't say there's one technology, and this is one of the things we're talking to a lot of our clients about, is it's not just buying or enabling one thing. It's how you're thinking about the whole journey. So whether I am just browsing and trying to kind of gather what I might be interested in, or maybe I'm very focused on what I want, but how am I, am I working through that entire journey pretty seamlessly? So I, does Amazon go thing, there's some irony for me in it. And I always have to chuckle yeah. that, you know, the company that revolutionized online and really pulled uh, people from stores into online now is going back into stores. But yeah. for the people who don't know Amazon Go, can you just tell us a little bit about what that is and what's so special about it? Yeah. Uh, there's only a handful, even that stores in the country right now. So, but just can, can you guide us through that journey? So, so there's only a handful, which I think is a key point because the, the press around it and the ripple effect it's having and how people are thinking about it is pretty powerful. So it's a new concept store where there's no checkout required. So imagine, You've got beaker, beacons and cameras, and you're, you have a vision so they can see the entire store. There are, are sensors on shelves, so I can go and I can pick up something. There's customer tracking, so it recognized me when I came into the store. It knows what I've picked up. It knows what needs to be replenished. So it's like the entire store, from what the consumer sees, is fully automated um, and intelligent, you could call it. And then I can actually... Um, you know, leave the store and it knows I didn't have to go to the counter. I didn't have to go and wait in line. So, you know, they launched their first, they have several stores now and they've just now recently, they're launching a smaller format. So this one is, I think 400 or 450 and it's really just more prepared meals. Um, and there's talks about going into airports. So, so this, is it groceries only or is it, can I buy books there too and stuff? So there are a few formats that they have now. And there's actually, I believe it's in uh, Chicago. And we have the Amazon bookstore here in DC, where it's actually books and then best selling like top rated items. So they have a few interesting formats um, that they're testing being in retail space in a physical store. And there's actually a store where you can go and it is all of the best rated items. And it plays to the idea of showrooming as well. So this concept where I don't have to have everything in the store, but I can seamlessly purchase and have it delivered to me. You combine that with the speed of delivery in, in some of those cities, it's really changing the paradigm of, and has been, but now it's really bringing it to life. Um, and you've got parts of retail that never thought they would be impacted that are really having to rethink, what is my version or how do I leapfrog it? Another interesting one that's had a lot of press over the past couple of months is, you know, Kohl's actually has a partnership with Amazon and you can return products into oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. in a hundred stores. So, you know, from a Kohl's perspective, they are helping to process the Amazon transaction, but they're getting the foot traffic into their store with the hope that when she comes in to return that, she walks through the Kohl's store and picks up some other items and there's a Kohl's transaction on the backs of that. So, but isn't it true that 
the company that has the best return is so far ahead. It's the hardest piece to do, but it's also <laughs> the piece where I, if I go somewhere and I have a crappy return experience, I'll never go back. Because there's sort of like this whole, how can I get back out? You won't go back. If you have to wait in a long line, you're irritated over it, if they give you a hassle. So, you know, we often forget that 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 customer journey. So if you think about the whole experience that are that I, that you as a shopper have with a given brand or retailer, it is all parts of it. A bad experience on the back end can make you just as frustrated as if you can't find your product at the beginning. So does Kohl's actually keep the product and resell it or do they ship it back to Amazon? No, they are the processing center. So oh, okay, so they don't keep it. It's not like uh, now I get a discount if I get the Kohl's on return to Amazon product. And you can, you're bringing your product in and you don't have to have it packaged. So that's, that's one of the key differences. I don't own a printer anymore. <laughs> See, so, so that's, that's the interesting thing in this. Um, I think we're going to see more combinations and partnerships of people working together and enabling technology in different ways. Um, you know, there's a lot of conversation around when will we see some of the, the augmented, the digital rally really come to life in, in retail. I think you're going to see it across different partnerships and maybe different types of retail. So what we may see in a grocery store could look more like, look, I'm going in, it's about convenience, finding my product and getting out easily. If I'm in more of a luxury store, I need to touch and feel, and maybe I do want to actually try on and have an engaging experience with an associate, I might enable technology in a different way that allows me to see or experience or see what that might look like in an environment. Or if I'm buying a sofa and I want to see how it would fit into my room. I think the spectrum of how IoT and these technologies comes to life is going to look different based on who I am, my value prop, and how, how I am engaging with my end consumers. Very interesting shopping experience and how it's going to change with technology. If you're just yeah. joining us, I'm Robert Schmidt, the Chief IoT Technologist for Deloitte, and you're watching Coffee with Mr. IoT. Today, I'm talking to Christina Bionic, and we're talking about uh, Santa IoT technology in retail. So I, I want to ask you something, and then I'm... I have two questions, and um, the first question is, so Amazon Go, I love it. I find it interesting. Um, I'm all in. Yet, I do know there is a certain creep factor when people feel like, oh, now they're going to track me where I walk around in the store and so forth. Yeah. And so um, that's my my experience and what I've seen. And I personally have to say that I've been a little bit uh, disappointed in how tentative retail has been in terms of engaging some new technologies. And I think it has to do with margins and all these kind of things. So I get it. But yeah. I've seen more in factories, for example, that they do and yeah. so forth. But now with Amazon Go, I wonder how do other clients deal with the creep factor? What do they think? And what are they pushing into? What What are the things that you're going to see like really going to come down next year? So I'm switching from this Christmas. What's yeah. going to be next Christmas? What do you think? And I know we have a really connected store too, so I'm sure you'll talk about that. And I'm going to shut up because I've asked too many questions already. <laughs> so look, the creep factor is heavily, heavily debated at our clients. And there are mixed opinions. You know, I think there is a certain sentiment that says at some point in time, it becomes somewhat acceptable that if you're not, if you're doing it in a well-intended, helpful way, and you can get the consumer to understand that. So if me walking into the store with my device helps me to know that you to know that I'm here, you to know that I was searching something online and direct me to where that is in the store, I actually don't mind. It's if you abuse that relationship and you're blasting me inappropriately or tagging me for things that don't fit. And so this is where I think the balance for retailers is how do I find that the right way to engage based on who I am? There are some product categories and retailers where they don't want anyone bothering them. Like the consumer expects a self-service model. They're not looking to be followed in a store. They don't need to be directed. Maybe it's just better content and product information. There's others where it can be the direct opposite. So I think when we look ahead to next year, we are going to see um, for sure greater data and insights 
that are going to drive a more granular, personalized touch point across all touch points. So whether it's in store, whether it's online, whether it's product recommendations, you know, the winners from a retail perspective are going to be the people who can get more granular to understand subsets or cohorts of their consumer population and best meet those needs. So I think that is hands down one thing we will absolutely see. I think you will see more people focused on whether you call it frictionless checkout, seamless checkout, you know, whatever you want to call that experience that allows me to get in and get out, particularly once I've identified what I want to purchase. I you have shrinkage numbers on this? Do we have actual numbers, how shrinkage changes? Shrinkage, you know what I mean. So I, there's different terms for it. I don't know which term you use, but... Um... In terms of well, uh, how quickly I convert versus losing sales. No, I meant how much stuff walks out without being paid for. Oh, okay, yeah. So th there's a big conversation around what happens if I do you know, the Amazon Go concept. Yeah. It's too early to predict what will really happen to shrinkage. But look, a lot of our clients face a, a shrink challenge already today. So this gets into like, do you do it across all product categories? You know, how might you do it differently? I'm not sure I'm going to have, uh, you know, a just walk out the store on a $2,000 item. So I think there will be some variation on how they do it. But you see some retailers dabbling with it now. It's not quite seamless. But you've got somewhere I can be in line and I can do a, a scan and go with my mobile app um, for certain products or certain categories. So you're seeing it. I think we'll see more of it next year. Um, and I, I think we'll see more. The other thing that everybody's trying to solve is how do I quickly have product ready and make that last mile of delivery as fast and efficient as possible? So I think we'll see some interesting things that could be consumer facing to make that easier, whether it's scheduling, whether it's the offerings of how I get the speed of my delivery, the ease again of that experience when I go to pick up my product. Um, I, I think we'll see more of that as well next year. I've personally experienced now that I I use the, I shop both at Home Depot and Lowe's, okay? So I'm, yeah. I'm not discriminating here. Yeah. Um, but I go and I go on the online app. And so first of all, I'm really picky on search. If the search isn't good, because I mistype, right? And we're so used to having mistyped words oh. still find what I want. Yeah. And some of them just are terrible at it, right? Terrible. But, but then the thing that happens is, then the next one is if they have low inventory, I can't pick it, which is so sort of like, really? But then the last part, and this is the part I found most interesting in my experience was, um, if I order it, I want it ready within an hour. So <laughs> I start judging the retail on how fast they pick. If it takes them half a day, I'm not going to go back and order from them. So there's just really sort of interesting stuff that I experience in shopping experiences that you can't really figure out until you try. you got to go and try it with your customers. And this is where the data comes in wow. you talk about. Totally. It's that, that whole last mile whether you want to pick it up in an hour, have it delivered in two hours, whether you're willing to wait two days. You know, I recently had an experience where I'm still waiting on a product. And I, to your point, I'm having that moment of like, I'm not going to shop there anymore. Like, and it's also, if someone's not communicating to give me the update, even if I'm willing to wait, but there's no seamless communication of when it's going to get here, I'm even more frustrated. And this definitely varies based on the product category, what my willingness as a consumer is to just demand it right there in the moment, expect you to have it in stock, expect you to have it ready in an hour or ship to my home. And, and really the tough thing for retailers is it costs money. I mean, they are all in a fight to figure out how to optimize that supply chain so that I can get something in the way the consumer wants it based on that product category as cheaply and most efficiently and kind of effectively in a seamless way. This is, I think we sometimes underestimate, we spend a ton of time thinking about the automation and things we can do around the, the front end of the experience, but getting that product to the end consumer and what I'm doing to invest on that, I think is equally as important um, for all, all of our, our retail clients. Who is the most scared of Amazon Go? <laughs> Um, I think all grocers, yeah, all our clients, we're, you, you, it's sort of like, this is a, I'm screwed no matter what answer. <laughs> it's kind of like, 
It doesn't matter how big you are. Many would say, and you could read this anywhere publicly, there's a full on battle between Walmart and Amazon. Um, you know, we don't have Alibaba here, but if you really were going globally, many would put them in that bucket. But I got to tell you, if I'm a convenience store, I'm fighting to say, how and what do I need to do? Um, if I'm a drug store, I'm trying to fight for share of some of those same product categories. If I'm a grocer, I've got the same fights going on. And then you've got your kind of bigger box players, your mass players. So it's pretty holistic in terms of, but here's the other thing that I would say, Robert, that I think is interesting. It's changing consumer expectations. Mm -hmm. So once something starts to get out there and get mainstream, and this is what we saw several years back, everybody has to have some form of buy online, pick up in store, return from store. Because once a certain number of people started to do it, it just pivoted to be an expectation. And the tough thing is, if I'm a retailer that sells things that are $5 per item, for example, versus 90, I've got a much different margin <laughs> to work <laughs> to deliver that product or to fulfill those consumer expectations. So I think we are, you know, it is pervasive across every format. Kind of what does this mean? When does it scale? And what's that tipping point where there's just an expectation that everybody can do it? That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, even though you didn't give me a direct answer, I thought it was a great yeah. answer. Thank you. I can't, we love everybody. I know. I know. I know. I know. It's just, um, it, it, I totally get it. So I, I want to switch to um, sort of like you. You've been with the firm uh, how long? You know what? I just hit seven years. Congrats. I just yeah. hit four. I joined in November four years. I rejoined in November four years ago, I should say. So congrats. Oh, well, you might have more tenure than I do, but we're we're kind of newbies, I like to think sometimes. <laughs> very, nice, very nice. So I wanted to ask you, uh, you were top 25 consultants in 2014. Uh, how do I get this in 2019? What do I have to do? Oh, wow. Um, you know, here's what I would say, and I say this to people that know me well, I love this job. Um, I get up every day and I think retail consumer products, I feel like we're, we shape the way the work, the world lives and works every day. And so for me personally, when I think about that award, um, it was really about the clients and teams. Like those are the two things that I love is our teams being in a team room, being in the thick of the battle with our team and then our clients just solving complex problems and the thrill and the adrenaline that you get when you're in the chaos, you're not sure how you're gonna get it all done. Um, and it's the combination of just our people, um, the teams that we have and clients that I love, and I will index all day long on those two dimensions. So I think, you know, if you're looking at 2019, you know, teams and clients, put a little IOT magic around that and maybe you can make it happen. Come on, have you seen our rubber duck factory yet? We have a we have the app called Virtual Factory by Deloitte, and we're making rubber ducks on that. So augmented reality. I think this is going to be, by the way, to end on that note. If you had any thoughts on this, I'd be happy to hear them. But I think augmented reality will sort of like the Pokemon Pokemon Go uh, phenomena will hit us all in other ways that are not gamified but actually meaningful. What do you think? I think that's right. We um we have a connected store experience in one of our studios, actually in New York. And we have brought in several elements of augmented reality, and it's not in a gamified way, but really allowing me to see um, one with like a true visualization of me with product on. We had another where you could see a table and we had, um, it was actually with footwear, we had a couple of different pieces of footwear there and we were able to move one, put it on, we imposed another. And in very simple ways that a consumer could do it and I could, walk through a shopping experience with some augmented reality um, elements that were real and they were, they served a purpose. I think that's the key. It wasn't just cool for cool sake, but it was actually helping me through my purchase journey and ultimately to get to a purchase. So I think we'll, we will absolutely see more of that. Yeah, I mean, as much as we all loved Google Glass and all those things, people think you need that when you really don't. We all have this here, right? Exactly. This piece. And, you know, we can just use this for that. And that's the piece we often forget. That's exactly our, our store simulates exactly that. 
and allows you to have a couple different experiences just with just with your device. Well, Christina, thank you so much for having you. It was a really fun uh, Santa Christmas holiday show with you. Thank you for that. Um, coffee break is coming to a close. If you missed any conversation uh, today or any past shows, uh, they are all on my YouTube channel. Please come back. And with that, I want to say goodbye. See you next week, Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern again. Thank you, Christina. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you.